Okay, so today we are still in John chapter 1, and we're going to be continuing with our discussion of John the Baptist. Last week we talked about the beginning of the testimony of John the Baptist, and he was speaking, we'll just do a, a real quick review. Who was he speaking to in verses 19 through 28? There's a group who comes to see him. Yeah. And who Levites. was that? The Levites priests. and the Pharisees. Very good. So there were the Levites and the priests, and they were sent from the group um, in the Jewish temple called the Pharisees. So um, if we're okay. thinking about what the roles are, the priests here are sort of like the priests uh, in, in, in today's churches and temples. These are the, these are the, this is their job to do this, you know, to work in the temple. The Levites are sort of like lay people. They, they come on and off. They do work in the temple, but it's not their primary job. Um, and we could go into the, the history behind the Levites, but they were sent from the Pharisees and they were sent for one reason. John was doing something that they were not normally doing. He was baptizing, which was a thing they normally do, but he was baptizing anybody, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, children, it didn't matter. And before that, do you remember what the context was for when the Jews would normally baptize a person? What, 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 were the, what was this sort of going on there when they would do that? Um, he would baptize them with water. Um, they would baptize with water. But the Jews here normally, if they were baptizing somebody, it was a Gentile who was becoming a Jew. Because Ju oh. Judaism is not a, a national thing at its core. It's not a race thing. It is a, a covenant of faith thing. And so a Gentile could be brought into the Jewish faith through a process. Um, and in the end, they would be called a proselyte. A proselyte, which is just what we call somebody who has become a Jew. And the part of the process of that would involve baptism involve a symbolic cleansing of their body. Well, John here has come along and he's gone out to the Jordan River. Here's our Jordan River. And here's stick figure John. And he's baptizing people in the Jordan River. And he's saying, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's saying, turn back to God because the king is coming. He is trying to point the way for people to Christ. He, he is preparing their hearts. He's restoring them to God, restoring the hearts of children to their fathers and fathers to their children, so that when Jesus comes, they will be spiritually ready to receive him. And the Jews, uh, the Pharisees in particular, were a little miffed at this because this is a different form of baptism than they've performed in the past. And so if you're going to go out on a limb different than what they do, you need to have authority and so they, they came and questioned him about it. And right off the bat, what does John start doing? Does he talk about himself? Does he engage them in their questions? Uh, he says, I am not the Christ. He says, I am not the Christ. He turns it up immediately around and points to the Christ. Now, this word Christ in Greek, Christos, is the exact same word in Hebrew, as Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Anointed one. And in, um, in that day, there were three offices that were anointed. This was to be anointed with oil was something that was a sign that you were chosen by God to do a specific role. So one of those was a prophet. Prophets were anointed. Prophets bring the words of God to the people. Priests were anointed. Priests bring the cares and concerns and sacrifices of the people to God. So you see, prophets bring the words of God to the people. Priests bring the, the troubles and cares and concerns and sacrifices of the people to God. And then kings were anointed. This was someone anointed by God to be a ruler. And captured in this word Messiah is all three of these roles. Whenever we talk about Jesus as being Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. This is a title. 
This is, this is pointing to his messianic work, his role as the anointed one, his role as prophet, priest, and king, all rolled up into one. So he immediately starts to point to Christ. And when they ask him for, well, tell us, tell us about yourself. If you're not going to tell us your name or what your deal is, you know, tell us something about you. And he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And so he sees himself entirely as being a forerunner of somebody much more important than himself. And he's going to talk about that some more today. So let's start reading. We're going to be in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And if you will read for me, um, that's six verses, five verses, six verses. Bumsy, if you could read for me the first three. Let's see, 29 through 31, and then I'll read the last ones. Okay. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for his for this purpose I became baptized I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Good. In verse 32, and John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the, <clears throat> this is the Son of God. So here, I'm going to write these up here in the corner. Um, here we see two new names for Christ. A couple of weeks ago, um, we started out by learning about the word. The word in Greek being logos. We also called Christ the light and life earlier in the prologue. Um, that he's also Jesus Christ. We talked about that name a minute ago. Um We've got a name in the prologue, Son of the Father. And here we've got two new names in this passage. The, the Lamb of God. And what's the other one? In the very last verse, in verse 34. Son of God. Son of God. Good. Son of God. So we're, we're, we're gathering quite a collection of names for Christ. And each of these point to a different aspect of him. You know, it's, it's a name is, is more than just an identifier. In this case, it's a descriptor. Um, here, we're going to focus on this one today, Lamb of God. This one's going to keep coming up, that, that Christ is the Son of God um, in two senses. A, he was, um, he was born of God to a Virgin Mary. Okay, he didn't have an earthly father, but also in the sense of the Trinity, where you've got the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and that these three form the three members or persons of the Trinity, of the Godhead. This is all one God, not three gods, one God, but in three persons. And this is, this is we're not going to get into that here, Um and it's also a very hard concept to sort of wrap our minds around because I'm one person. I'm not multiple persons in one body. I'm one person. The God is three persons and yet one in divine nature. So that's what the Son of God there is referring to. We're going to focus on Lamb of God. And before we do, I want us to talk about the context for this particular passage. When does this happen? And, and that kind of is going to help us understand why John is using the words that he's using. So if we'll look at, go ahead. Did you have a question? No, no. I, I just remembered one more thing. Did, uh, doesn't Emmanuel also name, is one of the words for Christ? Yes. Very good. Emmanuel. And what did Emmanuel mean? Oh, uh, something about light. It means God with us. 
with us. Huh? God with us. And that's right. We talked about that in verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This idea that God is with us in the person of Christ. Um, that this is the fullest manifestation of what in the past, um, in the times of Moses and Joshua and the early tabernacle and temple, that word tabernacle means to pitch a tent or to dwell among a people. Emmanuel means God with us. Yeah, very good. It just kind of popped. <laughs> you, are you reading your notes or you just remembered? I remembered. <laughs> That's fantastic. Very good. So, um, I want us to look at the context here. We've got the first conversation of John happens, verses 19 through 28. Then in 29, that's what we started on today, it says the next day. And then if we look at the very next section, verse 35, it says the next day. In verse 43, it says the next day. So John, the evangelist, as he's writing this gospel, after summarizing the entire gospel of Jesus Christ in the prologue, he's now going through day by day the events leading up to him personally meeting Jesus. He was, he was not just a disciple or a follower of Christ. He was one of the, the three sort of inner circle, the three who got to see some of the most intimate miracles and wonders and teachings of Christ. And he's recalling to us now the steps by which he personally got to meet Jesus. That's going to happen next week in our lesson next week. Here, we're still leading up to that. But I want us to note something. We're, we're on a particular day. We're on the second day in this journey. Verse 35 starts the next day. And you have an ESV Bible. What is the subheading there right above verse 35? Jesus calls the first disciples. Good. So that kind of tells us what goes on in that paragraph. Now remember, subheadings are not scripture. This is extra biblical. This is just a study aid to tell us what's in there. But that is correct. He, he begins to call his first disciples. And so it kind of looks like John's talking about the baptism of Jesus in verses 32 through 34. And then the very next day he calls disciples. But that's not the story that's recounted in the other gospels. Okay, so I want us to go read those to help us understand what's going on right here. Why is this different? Why is this ordered a little differently? Let's go read in Matthew chapter 3. Keep, a, keep your bookmark or a finger in the Gospel of John and turn with me to the first book in the New Testament, which is the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is often described as the Gospel to the Jews. Um, this is a, a, a Jew writing to Jews. He talks a lot about genealogy. He, he talks about things that they would have known about from the Old Testament to help them understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah and what his role is. And so here in Matthew chapter 3, he begins to recount the baptism of Jesus. And this is going to help us with the timeline. So I'm going to start reading in um, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. Are you, are you, are you with me there? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, the baptism of Jesus. Very good. So, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John. Now, this is John the Baptist. To be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. So John at first said, whoa, I'm not worthy to untie your sandals, and you want me to baptize you? And Jesus said, no, 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 this is how it's supposed to be. We're going to do it this way because that's how it's supposed to be. In verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So here, John has been given a sign. John the Baptist has been given a sign. 
He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. His job was to prepare the way for Christ, and he was related to Jesus. They were cousins, but they lived in different towns. They may have never actually seen each other. And, and so he, he hasn't been told divinely that Jesus is the Christ yet. He's got a hint of an understanding because obviously he kind of feels it. He says, whoa, I, I can tell you are, you are, I probably need to be baptized by you, not the other way around. But then he gets a divine sign that this is the Son of God. This, the heavens open and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And so I've got, you know, we, I've got a reputation to keep with my stick figures. So here's John the Baptist. And here's all the crowd around. And then Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. And he's coming up out of the water. And here comes the Holy Spirit down like a dove. There's my stick figure dove. And he comes down and rests on Christ. And to make sure John doesn't mistake this sign, even though it was described by God, God speaks from heaven. The Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So this is the baptism of Christ. Now, we came to this passage to look at the timeline. So, Vamsi, read for me, still in Matthew, but chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the very next two verses. Okay. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Good. So Jesus leaves here immediately. He leaves the baptism and goes out into the wilderness by himself to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Good. We're not going to read that just yet. I want you to then go, after all of that is done, go to verse 18 of chapter 4. There it is. Yeah, Jesus calls the first disciples. Very good. So, wait a minute now. Does that sound like the next day? Yeah. Or, or is there something else going on? So, there are a, a lot of people who say, look, I've read the Bible, but there's so many conflicting things in it. How can I believe something that's so contradictory? How do we know it's true? I mean, if we say the Bible is true, but there's stuff in this that doesn't match up. What's the deal there? So let's draw out this timeline, okay? Because we kind of, we know some things that are happening. We know that Jesus was baptized. I'll put a letter B. And then at some point, it, right after the baptism, this says he went out into the wilderness for 40 days. And then he calls his first disciples. I'll put a letter C. All right. So now that we've got that timeline, let's go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 32. Are you back? Yeah. Good. All right. John chapter 1, verse 32. And John bore witness. We can just stop right there. What tense is that in? We're going to get into grammar today. The past tense. That's past tense. He bore witness. He's talking about something that happened in the past. And, it, and now he's also using past tense in the story that he tells. He says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained past tense on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. He's talking about what happened on the day of the baptism. That he saw what happened, the sign God gave, and then he himself bore witness. That means this is the Son of God. He told people about it. Now he's recounting that story. So what is he doing in this passage? In verse 29, it says the next day he saw, he saw Jesus coming towards him. Well, where has Jesus come from then? If he's talking about the baptism in the past, and he's been in the wilderness for 40 days. Where's Jesus coming from? Uh, I think he's coming back from the fasting, 40 days of fasting. Very good. He's coming back from the 40 days. And so 
this is Jesus returning, and it's really like the day before. This is his return from the wilderness. And so if I draw my picture again, here's the Jordan River. It gets squigglier every time. And here's John baptizing people, and here's Jesus coming back from the wilderness. And he sees Jesus. Now, Jesus has not just been fasting. He's been under temptation. The, his, the purpose of him going out there wasn't just to be hungry. He, the, Satan, the adversary, came to him at the end of that 40 days when he's as hungry as he could possibly be and tempts him with three different temptations. And Jesus refutes each of those temptations by quoting scripture to him and rejecting Satan and his offer. Then he returns and begins his earthly ministry. And John sees him returning. And I don't know about you, but if I was in the wilderness for 40 days fasting, A, I'd be a lot skinnier than I am now, and B, I'd look pretty rough. Okay, circles under my eyes, uh, my beard would just look awful. It would probably have dirt in my beard, you know. Um, I it, can't imagine what my shoes look like. Okay, especially if I wore sandals in that day and I'd been out in the wilderness hoofing it. Um, and he sees this. This is the same guy he baptized 40 days earlier. Now he's returning. He looks like he's suffering. He's been suffering for 40 days. And he looks at Christ, and what is the first thing out of his mouth? In verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God Behold who takes away the sin. The Lamb of God. Now, what a weird name. The Lamb of God. He's, he, and John the Baptist loves to quote scripture. Remember, he quoted a passage of Isaiah and attributed it to himself last time. This time, he's pointing again to the book of Isaiah, but a different chapter. That's what we're going to go read now. This is Isaiah chapter 53. So keep a finger or a bookmark in John. Turn with me to Isaiah 53 and use, mine just flips open because I've been studying it there this week, but use your table of contents. Isaiah is one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. Do you know why we call him a major prophet instead of a minor prophet? No. Because his books were bigger in the Bible, okay? The minor prophets, they're shorter books. The major prophets are bigger books. They're not more important. They didn't do specialer things. They just have bigger books. So he's, got one, of, he's one of the major prophets. And Isaiah wrote a lot of prophecy that was specifically about the Messiah. And that's what Isaiah chapter 53 is all about. Isaiah chapter 53 is one of the suffering servant prophecies. Suffering servant. You let me know when you get there, because we're gonna yeah, read I'm, most of it. I'm there. Good. All right, so if you'll read for me, I think there's 12 verses, yes. If you'll read for me the first six verses, and I'll read the second six verses. So you read 53, one through six, and then I'll join in after that. Okay. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. 
we have turned everyone into his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away oh i i passed 6 no you keep going you're doing you're doing great i tell you what you go to 12 you're doing great <laughs> okay and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth yet it was the will of the lord to crush him he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days the will of the lord shall prosper in his hand out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities therefore i will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors, transgressors. very good yeah. very good now you did awesome Thanks. you can always read my part that's perfect um <laughs> so this this chapter is you know if you read it it's all written in past tense but every single verse in it is talking about christ every single verse in it is talking about christ and there are many uh what you might call prophetic um foretellings signs that show to us that these are about Jesus um when it says that they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death Jesus crucified on the cross was crucified between two thieves criminals but when he was taken down he was buried in a rich man's tomb a very wealthy man who was a follower of Christ who had bought a piece of land with a tomb in it reserved for himself and his family and he buried Christ there and when it talks about how he was like uh, a lamb led to his slaughter he opened not his mouth like a sheep before its shears is silent so he opened not his mouth when Jesus was before his accusers he gave no response um he he gave no defense he gave um he he did not even open his mouth because he knew that his job was not to defend himself in that instance it was to be crucified he came knowing that his his role was not to go free his role was to be captured by sinful men hung on a cross and and by that sacrifice bring many to be reconciled with god so here when john the baptist says behold the lamb of god he's pointing back to isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 he's he's seeing christ coming back from the wilderness suffering and he's knowing that man is going to need to suffer a whole lot more in order to accomplish what he came here for this is the suffering servant this is the lamb of god this is the one that i said came after me but ranks before me this is the one that 40 days ago i saw the spirit descend on him like a dove and i know he is the son of god but he's talking in that first verse about his suffering sacrificial work and what is the result of his suffering and his sacrifice i want you to keep a finger in isaiah chapter 53 because we're going to come back there real shortly but in john chapter 1 verse 29 if we continue that verse behold the lamb of god who does what takes away the sin of the world takes away the sin of the world now we're not going to get to the of the world part just yet we're going to talk just about this phrase takes away sin takes away sin now there's a theological word for that that we call expiation the expiation of sin 
Expiation is a taking away of sin. You can see this, this root word ex, to go out or to take out. The taking away or taking out of sin. And this process of taking away sin is not just a hand-waving thing. There's, there's a process by which this happens because there's something that's happened between us. We talked before the call, before the recording, about the curse of sin. That curse of sin is what separates us from God. He is holy and righteous. He is, he is full of wrath for all sin all the time. That puts us in a bad spot. We are enemies of God in that spot. And here, he has sent his son to reconcile us to him. And so I want to draw for us a diagram. This is a diagram that, that helps me understand what's going on when we use the words take away sin. So on the right side of this diagram, I'm going to draw me. Okay, this is Mr. Scott. And you can tell it's me because he's bald. So that's, that's pretty easy. And then on this side, I'm going to draw a cross. This is to represent Jesus and his work. Okay, now something happened on the cross. It wasn't just a man who hung on a stick of wood and died that there was a punishment made on the cross, and the punishment was made for sin. But Jesus knew no sin. My sin and all the sins of all those who would ever believe in him was placed on him on the cross. This putting on of something that doesn't normally belong to it is called imputing, to impute. My sin was imputed to Christ. Um, we'll also use the word imputation, okay? It was imputed to Christ. And on that sin, he was, pun uh, on that cross, he was punished for my sin. We call this a uh, Christ's vicarious death because it was as though I died on the cross for my sins. He died on the cross in my place. Uh, we will also call this part of his passive obedience. We're getting deep in the weeds here, but he didn't put himself on the cross. Somebody else put him on the cross, but he allowed it to happen. It was sort of a passive act for Christ that he, he, when they came to arrest him, he did not stop them. This is a man who could stop the waves and the storm just by speaking. And when soldiers came to arrest him, they said, who is, are you Jesus? And he said, I am. And the very power of his voice drove them to their knees. And yet he still allowed himself to be arrested and hung on the cross. That This is a passive work. Now, being crucified on the cross and making the punishment for my sin is not all that it took to make me right with God. Because I'm still missing something that's required. Even though my sin has been paid for, I'm still a sinner. My sin is paid for, but I'm still a sinner. I'm still unrighteous. Well, that, there's another portion of Christ's work on this earth that we call his active obedience. His active obedience is Jesus Christ actively fulfilling the law as described in the Old Testament, doing the good things, that we're not able to do because we're under the curse of sin. And so he achieved by that a righteousness that comes by works. And that is now accounted to me. And so I'm going to write it over here again. This righteousness is accounted or imputed to me. And so you see this cycle. My sin is placed on Christ, crucified on the cross. His righteousness that he earned by his good works is now accounted to me. Now, here's what I, I, I want us to be clear on this. Let's say I drew up two ledgers. And at the top of this one is Jesus's name. And at the top of this one is Scott. And these are the lists of all the sins we've ever committed that separate us from God. Well, how many would be on Jesus's sheet? Zero. Zero. It's clean. Okay. Mine, however, is so full, there's no room left to write anymore. Because if you go read the Ten Commandments and all of the law, the law was given to be a mirror to our soul. It, it's not, here's a path for how you can be right with God, because we fail at every point in it. 
And then if you're guilty of only one, then you're guilty of all. So here, if you were just go down the, the Ten Commandments, I've, I've lied, I've stolen, I've committed adultery, I have broken the Sabbath. I mean, we could just go all, all the way down here. And, and when Jesus died and made this payment, and now my sin's put on him, and his righteousness is imputed to me, it's not as though God went down this, ch- this list and said, okay, this one's paid for, and this one's paid for, and this one's paid for. He goes all the way down the list and goes, all right, you're a sinner, but all these individual sins are paid for, therefore you're righteous. That's not the picture. The picture really is this. He crossed out Jesus' name and wrote Scott. And he crossed out my name and wrote Jesus. And so my sins are accounted to Christ and all of his righteousness is accounted to me. And at that point now, I'm justified. I'm reconciled to God. This is the process that we call expiation. And there's a related word to expiation that we'll see sometimes nearby, which is propitiation. Propitiation, if you were to go look it up in any dictionary, it would say that a payment having been made, this turns away the wrath of God. Propitiation is the turning away of the wrath of God. Here, this word pro, you can tell is a positive word that we're, we're being made right now with God. And so the result of expiation, of taking away my sin, the result of expiation is God's wrath is now turned away from me. And now I'm fully reconciled to him. Now, I want us to read some passages in Isaiah chapter 53. So I hope you kept a finger over there yeah. that, that, that point to this. Even before his work on the cross, this whole chapter points to who he was, not just so we could identify him, but so that we could identify his work and the result of it. Um, we'll just read, I'll read verses 10 and 11 again. Are you back in Isaiah 53? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. In verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. In other English translations, you'll see there, he has made him suffer. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Well, that's, that's those of us who become children of God. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that's Jesus, by the way, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And that's this cycle that we've just drawn right here. That's this circle that many will be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. Iniquities is another word for sin. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to just write it over here in the corner. You don't have to turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is this double imputation. My sins are imputed to Christ. His righteousness is imputed to me. This is what happens when you put your faith and trust in Christ. That when we look back at John chapter 1, verse 12, that as many as received him who believed on his name, on his person and his work, and everything I've just drawn right here is part of his work, that those who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. You have the right to become children of God if you put your faith and trust as this as the means by which you can be reconciled to God. Now, we didn't even get to the end of that sentence that he takes away the sins of the world. We're going to talk about that some more next week. We'll do a little aside, and then we'll continue on with the next day in the, in the journey here. Okay. Questions? Questions about my stick figures? <laughs> They're great. <laughs> they, they explain very well. <laughs> uh, interesting stuff. I, I realized that, like, if I was, if I were to just read it from top to bottom, I wouldn't understand much. <laughs> I mean, you put, jumping between the chapters and putting them into context makes a lot more sense, right? My 
when i wanted to read the bible my original plan is just like i'll start from top to bottom <laughs> but i realized like yeah it, it might not have made much sense to me at that point um i will say this reading the bible all the way through is very good it's included okay. in the order that it's in for a reason um and when we read like a whole book like this like the gospel of john it's good for us to remember that it's written as an entire work it it's you know front to back if you just read through the entire gospel of john in fact that might be a good thing to do this week um you you don't have to do it all in one day um but to just read through the whole gospel of john and it'll give you context on uh, the things that we're talking about now having read to where we're going to end up at the end of john uh, john does a good job of that of of bringing up concepts over and over to make sure that we remember them that there's repetition there um, now my wife has been reading through the entire bible sort of just straight through and she's now made it into the new testament um, she started many months ago doing that and has read through the entire old testament and is into the new testament and I will say that you'll read some things and go, I don't understand why this is important. Like there's some stuff in, especially in the Old Testament, when you get into long lists of genealogies, you know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and he lived this many years, and you're going, why is this important? And as you, you know, but you'll read through it, and then you start to get to the New Testament. And a lot of the things that you slogged through in the Old Testament come back up in the New as being the means and path by which God wove his plan of redemption through history, that he purposed throughout all of history to redeem a people of God for himself. And that you'll read books like um, Ruth, where you'll go, what does this have anything to do with anything? And it turns out that Ruth, who marries Boaz, is one of the uh, ancestors of Christ, that Mary, his 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 mother was a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. And so we see God working actively in history to bring about his son as, in, 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 as a baby, um, that really born, and that all of that ties together. And so if you're coming into this from, I haven't read a lot of the Bible before, and I'm just starting in just this one book, and you'll, go, you'll start to read it and go, I don't know these references, and that's totally okay. That's part of why we're having this study. Um, you know, when I read it, a lot of times I'm in that same spot. I'll read it and go, okay, what in the world does that mean? And then I've got some commentaries that I study that go alongside it from different theological backgrounds, different kinds of commentaries. Um, I've got study Bibles that have commentary, like here's the scripture and then the, the commentaries underneath. They give me big picture uh, of what's going on. And then there's also, um, my, this, the Bible that I'm teaching out of doesn't have this, but there's a lot of times study Bibles will have cross-references. And cross-references are usually like in the center column or at the bottom. And so for every given verse, there are other verses in the Bible that relate to that. They're either parallels of the same story or they talk about the same concept. And so you can jump to different places in the Bible and it'll help you understand things just by going in, down the cross-references. So this is something that as we study, I get to bring all these things into one cohesive lesson. But as you study personally, there are aids and tools that can help you when you're studying on your own time that you can, that you can take advantage of. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll do John this, this week then. <laughs> cool. And I'll put um, the script, scripture references from this lesson if you want to review. And then we also talked about the curse of sin. I'll find some, some, some background for that in scripture and include that in the channel too. Sounds good. Well, I've had fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, this is very enlightening. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't realize Bible is such an exciting <laughs> book to read. Is it, is it feeling exciting? Yeah, I good. think so. Good. This honestly, this is this isn't just good news. This is the best news. You know, when we when we use the word gospel, it means good news. That feeling of excitement. I mean, because the background for the gospel, for the good news, is bad news. And and like we talked about before, I 
a coming to an understanding that I've been a sinner since conception, which means I've been an enemy of God that whole time. I've been fighting for my own, what I want to do. Um, and, and this, as a guy who grew up in America, this rugged individualism, this, I can do what I want to do. I'm, I live in a free country. This is so counter to even what culture tries to tell me about what's right. That if I think that I know what's best, then I should go and do that. The Bible says something totally different. It says that every good work that I do is tainted by sin. I do it either out of selfish motives. I do it for personal gain. I do it, um, I, I do it not because I want to please God or because I love him or because I'm grateful to him, but it's all about me. And there's a word we use for that. We call that autonomy. This idea that I'm a law unto myself. But the thing is, is that I'm created. I was created by somebody else. I was created by God. And when he created the world, he owns everything. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, um, the stars in the sky, the entire earth, the most minute microorganisms all belong to him. And he's a holy God. And that, that's sort of hard for us to, to think about what that word means. I've read whole books on what that means. There are people in the Old Testament who were exposed to the holiness of God, brought into his presence. And the words they used were, I, I feel like I'm coming apart at the seams. I will die because I have seen the Lord. Well, God has a right to expect some things from us. He created us. He's king. It's appropriate for us to worship and to praise him and to obey him. And when we don't, we're separated from him. And that puts us in a bad spot because the king of all cosmos is now our enemy. But there's good news in that we can be restored to him. And that's what the Bible's about. When you get that feeling of excitement, as we're going through this and this is starting to make sense, you mean I, that can be, that can be me? I can be made right with God? That's fantastic news. So yeah. Yeah. That's why I get excited. Yeah. Or maybe I get to hear it from you. <laughs> so <laughs> I hear your, uh, you know, excitement and enthusiasm is contagious, I suppose. So, <laughs> Good. Good. yeah. Well, uh, Vamsi, before we go, I'd like to close in prayer. Um, is there something that I can pray for you for this week? Sure. Um, Oh, you're asking me, is there something I can... Sure. I'll tell you what. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Um, for those of you who are listening, I will put references in Slack, and uh, you can read more about those. And then I'll see you all next week for the next chapter in John. And then Bamzi and I will pray together.